Today we are going to start introduction to proof. And if you see in the first slide, it says if you are three feet tall at age two, then your adult height will be about six feet tall. Prove it. Proof is all about writing justifications, making an argument. People don't just believe you because you say so. You've got to back it up. So we're going to start learning proof by relying on something you already know how to do, which is algebra. So we turn to the next slide. Okay, what is proof? It's a method for making an argument. Statements are made and justifications are given. There are two styles of geometric proof. First style is a two column format where you've got a column for your statements and then you have a column for the matching reasons that back them up. The second style, which is the more realistic real world style paragraph proof, statements and reasons are written in sentence format. Um, we're going to focus on two column format simply because starting off it's going to give you good structure um, and a good outline for keeping you organized as you start to learn this. When we start our proof, we start out with our first column, making our columns, and we're going to put our headings. On the left column, we're going to title those statements. The right-hand column will be our reasons. When we start proof, we always have to be given some information, and you always have to be told what it is you're trying to prove. What you are trying to prove is going to be your very last step. It's the goal to which you're working toward. I will never give you anything that doesn't work. So if you follow the steps of a proof, and, and let's say, you know, here we want to prove A equals 3, and you get A equals 7. Either one of two things happen. Either I made a mistake, and I have a typo, or you made a math error. So the first thing you should do is go back and recheck your calculations to make sure that it matches. So when we start this, our first step will always come from our given information. So we're going to start our first statement, 5 quantity 3a minus 7 equals 10. And the reason, where did it come from? It was given to us. Notice that, I, that we are numbering the statements and the reasons as we go. So if it takes more than one line to write something, everything's organized and we know what matches with what. When we solve this equation, the first thing you have to remember is order of operations, which say parentheses first. <coughs> so we're going to knock out the parentheses. 5 times 3a is 15a. 5 times negative 7 is a negative 35. And the reason, if you can think of the property from algebra, when we multiply all the terms inside parentheses by a number outside, that is use of the distributive property. Next, if we're solving this equation, you would ask yourself, what do you have to do to get the A term by itself? Well, I have to move this minus 35. When we move a term, we perform the opposite operation. So the opposite of subtracting 35 would be adding 35. Now, notice I'm not going to put plus 35 to both sides in my proof. What a proof does is shows you what happens after you perform the operation. If you just want to tack it underneath so that you have it for your own work, that you could do that as well. So if I have 35 to both sides, in step 3, I'm left with 15a is equal to 45. What did I do to both sides? I added 35 to both sides. So this is the addition property. Now, what do you do to both sides to get the A by itself? You would divide both sides by 15, and you would be left with A equals 3, which, as you know, that is what we were trying to prove. Since we divided both sides by 15, our reason is the division.
In our next example, again, we're going to start out writing our headings, statements, and reasons. Step one always comes from our given information. And the reason is it is given to us. Once again, order of operations, we need to get rid of parentheses first. So we are going to multiply every term inside parentheses by a negative 3. Negative 3 times n is negative 3n. Negative 3 times positive 6 is negative 18. And this again was the distributor property. Now, before we go on any further, we notice that we have some like terms, 2n and 3n. So we're going to combine some like terms. 2n minus 3n is negative 1n. When we combine like terms, we're taking one representation, 3, 2n minus 3n, and replacing it with an equivalent form, negative 1n. Kind of like what happens when I'm not here. I am replaced, and we call my replacement a substitute. So we call this type of replacement the substitution property. Do not abbreviate substitution property with SUB, as that could be misinterpreted for subtraction. Please write it out. Now, continuing on. To get the variable by itself, we would add 18 to both sides, in which case we're left with negative 1n is equal to 23. Since we added 18 to both sides, the addition property Now, if you notice, we have negative 1, n equals 23, but we want to prove that n is equal to negative 23. And we're solving for a positive n. So now we divide both sides by negative 1. So we have n equals negative 23. Since we're dividing both sides by negative 1, it is the division property. Now we start applying some of the information we've learned about geometric terms into the mix here. Reasons are generally written in conditional form, if then. Remember in the last unit we were talking about converse, inverse, contrapositive, that sort of thing. Conditional, the reason we were doing that is because our reasons are generally written in if then form, and they're to be generic. They should not address specific segments, angles, etc but should summarize. And more of the reason why we do this is sometimes a reason may repeat itself. And if it's a long sentence part of your reason, it's much easier to refer it back and say, same as step three, same as step four, rather than writing it all out. And if it's in a generic form, worded, uh, it's easier to do that. So our first Here's our first proof, and we're still going to set it up in a two-column format, so we're still going to have our statements and reasons. We are still going to start out with our given information. Where did that come from? It was given. And we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a midpoint? Well, if B really is in the middle of AC, then it will cut that segment into two equal parts. So it does make sense that if it is a midpoint, that AB does equal BC. 
our reason, and this comes into the conditional form, what did we know? We know that B was a midpoint. So if a point, in this case B, is the midpoint, of a segment then what does it do? Well it cuts it into two equal parts. Better word than cuts is it divides then it divides it into two congruent segments. And there we have it. Next one. Again, we're going to start out. We're going to do our two columns. So we have statements. And reasons. Our first statement comes from the given. I'm going to put the ray symbol up there. So we're going to have BD bisects angle ABC. And that was given. And we ask ourselves again, what does it mean to bisect something? To bisect means to cut into two equal parts. Well, if angle ABC, which is the large angle, is bisected, then it's cut into two equal parts. So based on that first statement, we can say that angle ABD is congruent to angle DBC because if BD was a ray, so if a ray bisects an angle, then it divides it into two congruent angles. And there we have it. Now we're going to start adding on a little bit. Still again, statements and reasons. But now you'll notice we don't just have one given statement, now we have two. There's a couple schools of thought on this. Some people like to put all their givens in the first step. Uh, some people like to put them as they use them. I prefer and I would recommend that you write your givens as you use them. What I find is if we stick them all in the first step, we kind of tend to forget they're there. So our first statement is BA is perpendicular, that's what that upside down T is, to BC. I put a little check mark knowing that I used that statement. And that is given. Well, like I said, I'm never going to give you stuff if it's not going to be important. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean for two segments to be perpendicular? Well, here's BA and here's BC. They form a perfect corner. They will form a right angle. So we can say that angle ABC It's 90 degrees because if two segments are perpendicular, then they form a 90 degree angle. So that given information, let us kind of get another measurement in here that we know that this big angle is 90 degrees. 
Well, if we go get our next given, we know that the measure of angle ABD is equal to 40. ABD is this little angle up here. And we want to prove that DBC right here is 50. Well, it's pretty easy to do. If the biggest angle is 40 and one of the smaller pieces is 50, it makes sense to say that the measure of angle DBC is equal to 50. Now, what did we do? We subtracted. But it's not the subtraction property because we didn't subtract something from both sides of the equation. What did we subtract? We subtracted a smaller angle from a larger angle. So our reason is angle subtraction. If we wanted to um, add two angles together, we'd be using angle addition. You could also add and subtract segments. Finally, last one, two columns, statements, and reasons. I'm just going to change this in your notes, change it to prove measure of angle ABD. equal to 155. We're going to start out, first given statement, measure of angle ABC is 180, that is given. If you notice on your diagram, ABC is the largest angle, that's 180. We are also given measure of angle DBC is equal to 25. That's the smaller angle right here. How do you get what's left? You can subtract. So we can conclude that the measure of angle ABD must be 155. And again, we subtracted the angle, so our reason is angle subtraction. And this probably sums up how you're feeling right now. This is how the basic introduction to proof is. Statements, reasons, number your steps, write your given information, and interpret that information. There is one more problem left at the end of the packet. Please complete this and then bring it in to me to show me so I can check your work. If you have any questions, I'm always available to answer them.